So now on to Mr. John Willis, and I'm just going to give him a quick introduction. Uh, I've known John for quite a while. I actually uh, used to work with John. Yeah, uh, the way I got hired or got through my interview with John is I just mentioned graphite. And he's like, oh, you know your shit. Um, but I used to think John was a bit of an asshole, honestly. Yeah. Uh, and that's OK. I can say that because uh, he said, hey, I was kind of an asshole to you. So, <laughs> so we're there now. John, what number DevOps days is this for you? He's, he's stopped counting how many DevOps days he's been to. Uh, but he is one of the figureheads of the DevOps movement. Uh, there's actually a picture of him or a stained glass version of him uh, anointing us all with DevOps up there. You can check it out later. Um, but my attitude towards John kind of changed when uh, in 2014 we had the opportunity to go to DevOps Days Down Under in Australia. And then we also had the opportunity to go to DevOps Days Tel Aviv as well. And we were able to spend some time together and really start to get to know each other. And one thing that I've learned about John is that he has an amazing heart. Uh, he's a great guy, and his heart's always in the right place. Uh, and he's always there for you if you need something uh, as well. So without further ado, uh, I present to you Mr. John Willis. Thank you, Michael. Um, is that quicker there? All right. Okay. All right, so it looks like we're in a church. So before we get started, we're going to do a hymn that is so DevOps. But you got to sing with me. I'm sorry. You have to sing with me. Will the circle be unbroke? Come on. By and by, Lord, by and come on. All right, it's not working. Really? Come on. It's a church. It's him. All right. I tried. Like I said, I'm an asshole. All right. The divine and felonious nature of cybersecurity. Um, I am John Willis. I've done a lot of shit. I won't bore you with all that. Um, uh, I was a chef. Um, actually, Michael was there after me. Dell, done a lot of startups, 10 startups. Uh, probably my last two were pretty interesting. Helped sell a company to Dell. That was, that was the one me and Michael worked at. And then, um, I don't know, three or four years ago, I created um, an SDN type interface overlay for Docker. And uh, I sold that to Docker relatively fast, spent almost three years at Docker. And now I've just been out doing kind of freelance consulting, done a lot of meta stuff on the right, so uh, involved heavily in. I would say that, like, I'm not the smartest person in DevOps, but I would argue nobody is a more aggressive student of this phenomenon. A um, couple more things, um, one shameless plug. I've written like 10 books. This is the latest one I've done with Gene. It's called Beyond the Phoenix Project. It's an audio only and it is only one audible credit, just one. I am last shameless pug, why is this not working? Uh, next year, we should have the DevSecOps Handbook out uh, with James Wick at Shannon Lee, Sarah Mueller. This is gonna be as good as the DevOps Handbook if you enjoy that. And I think we're gonna, I'm gonna sign some, I don't know how many we have, so just get in line if you want signed copies of DevOps Handbook. All right, so um, my clicker is, uh, not well behaving. All right, so, so uh, like I said, this presentation is the divine and felonious nature of cybersecurity. So let's start off with the felonious nature of cybersecurity. Yeah, I guess he just doesn't like me standing over here. Um, Mark Andreessen, anybody know who he is? If you don't know, he just paid about 37, 30 cents a dollar on a $7 billion acquisition, which was GitHub, right, gets sold down. So he was the first investor in GitHub. Right? So he said in a Wired magazine, I think in 2008 maybe, 2009, that software's eating the world, right? Like we know this. Um, if we look at what we do today with Amazon and cloud and all the things, the abstractions of software, particularly open source, have enabled us to do incredible things. This has created a paradox. Now there's no turning back. You know, I joke that my, and not even joke, my 15 year old son is working on a TensorFlow application where he can actually get a video camera to recognize your face to unlock the door. And my kid is not a genius. He's just a regular kid. Like, you, no, nobody, only very few people maybe in this room could have done that 10 years ago, unless you went to MIT or you were working at some lab, right? That's what the abstractions are giving us today, the fact that this stuff is out there. The problem is, I don't know why this is not behaving, is that when you look at it from a security perspective, 
you take a different view of this that it is infecting our world. Again, I don't, there's no turning back. The abstractions are here to say cloud infrastructure. I mean, if you look at almost everything in Google and Amazon, it's all based on open source, right? Uh, some they develop and stuff, a lot is contributed. Um, but there's, there's a cost that we're paying for that. Um, this is a sneak peek. Don't tell the sonotype I've told you. This is the third year report called the State of Software Supply Chain. But if you really want to understand the, inf the infectious nature of what we're doing, um, you know, uh, and, and I'm not negative open source, I'm not negative like transformation and technology, I'm just trying to lay out like the paradox and the truth, which is you write 10 lines of code, it's probably a million lines of code. And this is something from their latest report that, so, so Sonatype runs a report, a supply chain report, so they, they look at our so software supply chain the way you would look like a Toyota supply chain. And they, um, they own Maven Central, so which is 80 to 85, maybe 90% of all the job activity in the world. And if you look at the chart there, um, in 2017, 87 billion downloads. Um, the breaches. Um, the average breach is supposedly around 8 million, but mileage varies. This is just a list of some of the real common ones. Home Depot, Office of Prevention. Anybody in the military? Ex-military? You're pretty pissed, right? Because basically everything about you has been in a while for, what, four or five years, right? Um, the Equifax breach, like $4 billion. People get fired, people go to jail. And these are, most of this is not the lost opportunity cost. There's not even a real lot of data. When Target, would, that breach, they were very aggressively developing their e-commerce strategy. Ross Clanton and Heather McMahon, Heather McMahon was basically redesigning the API infrastructure there. They had this breach and they were basically, like I don't know the calculated damage that did to them for their e-commerce offering that winter. Um, there's some data about like if you, um, I think a million records is basically gonna cost you about $40 million. Um, just some more numbers if you're not scared yet. Um, this was back in May, 1.5 million um, Java modules per week, 5 million node modules per week. If you haven't been paying attention to the infectious nature of what's going on in Node, again, I'm not saying Node.js is a bad thing. But you look at some of the stuff that's happening there, it just scared the hell out of you. Um, they say that, uh, the Sonatype report said that based on their data, 8% of all the things that you're downloading are vulnerable. In 2010, uh, 2018, the latest report, which isn't released yet, should be released in the next couple of weeks, it's now up to 10%. Right, so 82 billion downloads last year and 10% that is known vulnerable. Um, so are you scared yet? Anybody want to take a, like 10 seconds to look at this and tell me why you should be scared shitless about our industry? Anybody get see it? What is it? It's a dash R. So this is the DNS client for basically all Red Hat DNS clients, which is a shit script that had um, a vulnerability in it, which is the, 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 probably the most dangerous attack factor today is what they call remote command uh, execution, which means they find a way to hit like an HTML tag. I'll talk about Equifax feature in a minute, but like you can put in a shell script in an HTML tag and it will run on that system. And if that system has to be authorized, you're dead, you're pwned. So this was basically the dash R on a while read stops you from using escape character to put in some command in every DNS client. I mean, I don't even want to begin to start thinking about like Helm and Kubernetes configuration and YAML and all these little things that we're gonna experience. No turning back. Um, if you're really, really boring like me, you do your day job, you hang out with your kids, your wife forces you to watch something like Big Brother or, uh, or The Bachelor and you just do it because there's things you just have to do in life. Um, and, um, and then at parties, she brags about it, like, honey, I'll watch it, but don't tell our friends that I watch it. But anyway, I digress. After that, I go into Shodan, and I find friends startups companies where they're running. So let me say this very clearly. Friends don't let friends run default Jenkins installs. Okay? Now, the copy is to get really mad at me. He goes, John, we fixed that. And the laser, okay, all right, calm down. But like this, so like you start seeing what's out there in the companies. You know, if it's a startup of a friend of mine, I call them. So 
so? Yes, I live a boring life. I'm not like it. Uh, DBI uh, Verizon in 2015 had a report. And it was funny because I've been thinking about taking this out because I'm like, it's such great data, and I'll explain the data in a minute. But actually, the 2018 report refers back to it. So yeah, I got another couple of years. Um, they said that in their research that 97% of all the exploits in 2014 were to, or, um, could be related to 10 known um, common vulnerabilities and exploits, which is the National Institute of Standard Technologies database for um, basically vulnerabilities. It's the standard. There's a, uh, there's a, um, a ranking system from one to 10. Um, and here's the real kicker, which isn't in the paragraph. Eight of them were 10 years old at the time. Right, so as these companies, and you watch 60 Minutes talk about some cyber expert that has 40 degrees about how he uses algorithms, or she uses algorithms to do this. Think about this. This clicker is pissing me off. <laughs> so I'm really boring, because you know what else I do? I read SEC filings. How many of you, this is a little sidebar, Knight Capital, you ever heard of Knight Capital, right? It's a high-frequency trading company, second largest on NYSE. They do dark trading pool, algorithmic trading. Um, some sysadmin who didn't use Ansible Chef or Puppet, apparently, um, was installing uh, eight nodes and, um, in a cluster, forgot to do the eighth one. There was some old code in there, got into production, and did production trades. They lost like 400 million plus in, less than, in 45 minutes, and they were out of business the next day. There is a brilliant SEC postmortem on it. Um, but there's also a really interesting um, lawsuit against the Equifax VP of Engineering, who's going to go to jail, because um, basically when he found out about the breach at Equifax, he dumped his stock. Okay? But, like, that's fine. But what's really interesting is that tells you the whole dialogue and the timeline of what really happened, which is really cool. So um, here's the thing, Equifax could be you. I got friends over there. When you see some numbers, I'll show you later. There are a lot of you who are probably still running this vulnerability. So this isn't a counterfactual, I could have done it better, I'm smarter than that. It's just an explanation of what went wrong. So I don't like to sit here and say, I know better, I, they, would, they should have done that. They're FX, I don't know. The breach, so this is because of Struts 2, it was actually a parsing module in the Struts 2 Java library, which actually enabled um, remote command execution. It was tag, actually it's in the code. You can actually see it, I should have highlighted it, but somewhere in there there's a tag which actually runs an echo bin, a bin echo, sorry. Right, and um, so it was discovered on 3.6 in 2017. It was announced to the world on the 9th. The CVE, the National Institute of Technology, MITRE, basically showed up. For whatever reason, Equifax didn't get the email. Um, and even if they did, our good friends at Oracle, you know, for those guys, I actually will make fun of. But um, <laughs> so I'll counterfactual the shit out of them. Um, they actually, in their quarterly nice update, included that vulnerability. I actually won't make fun of them. We all suck. Right? So even if they would have fixed this, it actually showed up in the quarterly patch. Somewhere in June, there was some anomalous behavior at Equifax that they noticed on the edge. Again, own your own shit. They went out, instead of owning their own shit, they went out and basically hired some hotshot cyber expert genius people to come to find that it was a vulnerability that everybody else knew about three months ago. And then by the 29, they're addressing it in earnest. Um, they announce it in um, September, right? So by that time, I mean, the thing is, you'll see the, um, the, the vulnerability, the zero vulnerability to Pwn is now, um, in some cases, down to three days. And, and depending on who you are, it's down to minutes, right? Um, so you can't give these people. If you give these people three months, <sighs> They will AI the shit out of your, in fact, worse than that, some of these people, and I'm going to run, this is why I was run out of time, because I start talking about things I didn't plan on talking about, but um, the, uh, there's a whole set of dark web people that, like, they don't, like, they're, they're not really that risky, so they go in and they find about how your architecture is and where the breakpoints are, and they sell those on the dark web. So they get in, 
They're not going to court. They know, oh, my God, here, here, here. And then they'll, they'll publish and sell that. So at Fannie Mae, there's a woman called Sutra Longo. It's so DevOps, right? She was a Java developer for years, had an opportunity to manage the AppSec team, knew nothing really about security, said, what the hell? And it's one of those, when you have a hammer, everything's a nail. She just did everything from a Java developer's perspective. Um, I, I've got a link later, and I got some slides of um, her case study, but, and it's brilliant. Um, if, you, if you Google RSA um, DevSecOps this year, it's an amazing presentation what she did. And I, I guess some tidbits in it. But here's how they reacted on the day it was announced. So they got the emails for some reason. Um, they put a war room together with all the C-suite, including the CEO, and they realized this is really dangerous stuff. And the thing is, I've been to Fannie Mae a couple of times, right? And one of the things I love about companies, I'm a Toyota geek, lean geek. Toyota had this thing called the True North, it was single piece flow. You know, from everything I read and talked to research, it seemed like everybody knew their purpose there. At Fannie Mae, when you talk to the C-suite and you talk to most people, if you ask them what Fannie Mae did, they'll say, we're basically America's housing partner, and we put people in houses. So when Citrus said, we got a fire engine red problem here, and this is before the Equifax and CNN and all this, um, and said, we cannot be this company where we might jeopardize 150, uh, Equifax 148 million records, right, of our loan applications in the wild. So she put a POC. Here's the thing. She didn't wait the next day to call IBM or Accenture or Deloitte Touche or FireEye or Palo Alto. She put a team together. It was basically a curl script that aggregates and paralyzed against all internal and external URLs. And the ones that broke through with the punch list to the fix. But the next first thing she did before she had that prototype ready to run, she told the C-suite team, we have to shut down the production loan application. They said, how long? I said, don't know. We have to shut down. And we can't be. We're full of shit. I mean, she didn't say that. She's a nice, she would never say that full of shit. <laughs> if you're watching Citra, I know you didn't say that. Um, but I would say it for her. We're full of shit. If we want to say on our front page that we're a marrying house partner, and we know right now that there's somebody in our system already that's going to expose 100, 100 million records of our trusted customers. She got them to clo close down the, uh, over the weekend, right, to, which is a very active loan application time. And she had remediation in less than two days. Um, you know, I mean, not to pick on friends, but I have a lot of friends at Pivotal. Again, like, this is just a systemic problem in the industry. There was a similar RCE in spring. Now you're talking about really, really big effect um, that was uh, published in um, 17. And Pivotal didn't actually address it till um, like February and then March. And people are like, well, what should we have done? I don't know. Get some DevSecOps hygiene, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So, um, so the uh, Equifax breach, right? Um, this is also from the upcoming report from Sonotype. The uh, breach was discovered, discovered by most people in March. Equifax in July, it was disclosed in September, 12 months later, there's still 80 plus million, 80,000 downloads of it. So people, 80,000 people in February this year are still downloading the Equifax destroy your business breach. Um, just um, three weeks ago, another biggie in Struts 2. So NASA had this thing they did a while back about when they were looking for different planets, they called it Goldilocks zone. Right, and it's like the uh, anybody, any planet in an or, in an orbit that actually could is not too hot, not too cold. Right, and it comes from the the Goldilocks porridge thing. So I would say to you that security, this the Goldilocks zone for security. This is really simple, folks. We did this with Dev, Dev and Ops. We did this with Dev and QA. It's in the supply chain. We address security deeply embedded in a systemic way in the way we deliver software. It's that simple. I could drop the mic and I leave now, but I won't. <laughs> and I can't because this clicker doesn't work. So I'm going to give you the quickest in, in known history uh, DevOps presentation. 
Vernon Ward was CTO of Amazon, um, 2006, Wired Magazine interval, or actually an ACMR interview. He said that at Amazon we're different because we have this motto of uh, you build it, you run it. Kind of a mantra for DevOps for many years. Um, we, we embraced this thing called the Andon Cord. It comes from Lean. It was at, at Toyota you could pull, anybody on the line could pull the rope and stop the line. There's a famous story about a plant in Kentucky that built 2,200 cars a day. Uh, when the plant manager was asked, um, how do you do that? 20, they said, it's real simple. We pull the end on code 5,000 times a day. Right? Anti-fragility, right? Like breaking things, failure fast, right? The modern day version of that, if the clicker will, the clicker is the star of the show, huh? Well, I mean, so like, this is the canonical example of what we do, and it's the end on code model for software delivery, right? You know, um, block, 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 red gate, go back, developer fix, block, 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 red gate, go back, and over time this becomes uh, incredibly, creates resilience, right? It's the story of continuous delivery, continuous integration, um, and uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Um, so, if I wasn't married, if I wasn't old, I would marry, I would at least offer to marry Lily McKesson. She's the VP of engineering at Google. She's just incredible. Like just everything that exudes awesomeness about our industry, she is. Uh, she gave a presentation at Swamp Up last year. And I kind of knew these numbers, but like, and you could read the Google numbers. They're insane. They're like, they're Google. But that's the number that basically is that Google is that Kentucky Toyota plant. 150 million automated tests per day. 150 million automated, and, and I am certain that's probably 200, 300 million now. So in summary on really DevOps and, and what we did, you know, we had Agile that took us from days to uh, months to deliver software, right? And then like a lot of people in operations like, holy crap, like there's this block, we're not getting the last mile. DevOps was a last mile solving problem. From Agile people building up, saying, hey, we're going really fast, but like, oh, we can do that one in April, we can do that one in June, right? So DevOps was very much, you know, kind of, I would say, DevOps took us from months to days to deploy software. And the truth is that all of us, myself included, we forgot to invite security. We totally forgot. And we did. And so DevSecOps starts discussion about a year ago, two years. So I say, okay, now maybe the conversation, like, let's apologize. And then, um, you know, it's a, you build it, you secure it. Right? Like, I want my developers to basically deploy so, uh, software, and I want my, just like what we did for operations, operations people built operations meta, policy, automation, guardrails for developers to deliver things fast and not slow them down. That's what we have to do with security. We want the developers to own the security, and uh, is it working okay now? Doesn't really matter if the... So, um, so, so, yes, so basically, DevSecOps as an abstraction on our supply chain. It's just systemic, we, we apply it. it. It's the same kind, like, we're writing the DevSecOps handbook and we're kind of joking that, like, we're just basically, it's a redo, this time with security. And so here's the thing, when I look at, if you, if you came to me and said, and I visit a lot of companies, I mean, I spend, I, I, I just visit companies, I spend a lot of time with CIOs and then meet a lot of the people in the organization. If you came and said, John, I want you to see our DevOps. It's so awesome. We've done these great things. And I show up, and they're like, oh, we got a whole bunch of cool things with Eclipse. Version control, pain in the ass. Um, build thing, the developers hate it because it sends them all these alerts that they get mad at. But we kick ass with Selenium. Right? I mean, you know, we, like, we have like, behavior-driven development that is so aligned with the... We're like, like, man, you're kind of missing shit. Like the shift left thing, <laughs> it ain't going to work. There's nothing to shift left there. But this is basically what we look like in security today. And that, these are the more mature models. You know, it's, we've got gaping holes. We're not treating security like, oh, we got Qualsys, but we got this, we got that. But like, what do you do here? How do you shift left? How do you give a developer a seamless stream? How do I create as much momentum on catching things as early as possible? So a lot of, you know, you know, if I had to say, you know, in DevOps, we have this whole thing that'd be like a thousand definitions of DevOps and everybody's kind of right. You know, in three years, there'll be a thousand definitions of DevSecOps and everybody will be right. But I will tell you that my kind of description of it is really two things. Create an environment where developers can actually not only be faster, more resilient, but more secure 
without them having to do anything because the security people are building all that stuff automatically into it. I mean, there's a lot more to that story. And then secondly, treat the pipeline as a systemic solution that has a systems approach to delivering security. And that's really SecOps. So like, I don't care what the product is, and this, these are not an endorsement for any products. They're the easiest icons I could find. I'm lazy. Um, although, um, pro tip, at, um, at a Nexus conference, don't put JFrog in as the icon for artifact management. Just saying, it, it doesn't go over well, but, but um, good products. But, but it, in the meta, it's about as far left security training. If you can do threat model and design and requirements, um, a lot of companies tell me that the security people are not allowed to go to design and uh, requirement meetings because some legacy constraint. I mean, it, okay, stop that nonsense. Um, you know, um, basically, you know, um, scan as often as possible all the variants, dynamic, dash, SAST. If you know what those are, look them up. Ask your security people, why aren't we doing this in the pipeline? Um, you, know, uh, you know, so the other thing I'll say too is as you move to the cloud, there's, there'd be new dragons. Um, and they are the configurations. Because there's this like phenomenal, I love this. Uh, somebody gave me, they actually, they have a term, but so you're building, sorry to pick at you, but you're, you're working on your laptop, and you do some really cool new thing on Amazon, a new thing, and, and you cut and paste a couple of config definitions that you found on Stock Exchange. And it works just brilliant. You tell a couple of your friends, somebody over there says, has anybody done this with blah, blah, blah? And I think, you know, such and such did it. They ping you, you send them your config. Now theirs is actually not in a laptop, it's in a QA test environment. Then somebody over there says, has anybody and all of a sudden, that code that the three things that actually did work and the 10 things that will actually pwn you wind up in production. Because A, you don't treat it as an artifact that sits in, in source control. You don't um, do peer reviews. You don't, you know, so, so don't let configuration definitions be your blind spot. You know, per, you know, let's start with as simple as uh, uh, permissive security groups, permissive VPCs. But it gets a lot worse, Terraform, right, CloudFormation. Um, God forbid the things that we will find in YAML definitions for Kubernetes, and I love Kubernetes, so. DevOps Handbook has a bunch of shit on this. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I got like four minutes, man. You're laughing, just took 20 seconds. Um, the, um, I, I will tell you, you know, Shannon Leach is working on a book with us. The stuff, she, she, well, Shannon Leach works it into it. She has a 50-person internal red team that works for her. So that's all they do all along is attack their own system. She is the most advanced person I know in enterprise security um, when it relates to kind of DevOps and software supply. And one of the things that she spends a lot of time on is understanding, identifying, and aggregating her adversaries. She, she has blueprinted the, their economic rationale. She knows who they are. She uses a number of tools to do that. You have to kind of be Shannon Lee's to be able to do that. Um, and she's going to be writing about this. But one of these I love, when she shows up at RSA, so, you know, at beer, so like, what's your metric for security? And somebody will say, you know, um, highs and criticals per 10,000 lines of code. What's yours? Well, uh, reduction of known vulnerabilities, right? A whole list of things, right? And she'll say, mine is adversary retention rate. So this is a macro level uh, metric, right? You know, you talk about the DevOps handbook and and the stuff coming out from DevOps you know, Institute or more uh, the IT revolution, right? We talk about lead time and MTTR as, I call them macro level. If your lead time is shrinking and your resilience is shrinking and they're correlating together, it kinda doesn't really matter what else you're doing unless you're not like causing any felonies, um, right? Um, so this is a macro level metric in that she is testing the things that she's changing by how long the adversaries come to the site and stay. So imagine the whole thing, there's four houses, I'm a crook, which I'm not, uh, and um, I go to the first house, it's got like four German shepherds, a fence, and not going to do that one. Next one's got barbed wire, next one's got a screen door, no fence, probably going in that one. Right, so the, the, you have to understand the economics of why these people, these people, the worst adversaries, this is where I joke, I've never seen this live, but they're young kids in their underwear making half a million dollars a year, selling your data. And half the time, you don't even know they sold it. This is real economics on what these people are doing and how they're making a living. 
So she tracks who they are and whether they, they find your environment not economically feasible to waste their time. This is uh, Citra Longos. I'll have these slides up. Um, this is what she's done in her journey. Um, some of the kind of cool things they did, like 74, they've improved uh, close to vulnerability by 74%. Um, they've actually, 60% um, of all application teams are now using DevSecOps. Um, they reduced their CVA score. Uh, this one also, you might want to look this up, DZ Schlein uh, at Etner. He calls it uh, moving target defense. So he runs Kubernetes containers, and so he will constantly roll containers in clusters just because. So if you get on a container, even if you can, most of them are read only, like it's going to go away at some period. But better than that, he has hooked up his IDS so that if he sees something coming that looks like it might be an anomaly, he'll either A, blow away the cluster and rerun it, restart it, or if it looks a little more severe, just re-deliver the whole pipeline. Why? Because he can. You know, finally, um, I would say, you know, it's, it's a kind of a summary um, operational tips. Um, Michael, I'm going to need like three more minutes. <laughs> just, I'm an asshole. Um, I got one more slide I want to do. Uh, just ruthlessly, ruthlessly eliminate false positives. Spend more time on that. So don't think you're secure because you have a scanner. Um, explain vulnerabilities and business impact. Um, treat vulnerabilities like you would everything else, DevOps. Um, let everybody see the code. I, I just want to end with the divine. So we talk about code. So I said this, this presentation was the divine and felonious nature of search code. And I think I've pointed out the felonious nature of how we think, right? Um, so I got to interview a white, uh, no, a, a real hacker, an adversary that actually makes money. And he never heard of Palo Alto. He never heard of Fire, right? He doesn't give a shit about your software perimeter, right? Um, because he, four of the last five banks that he hacked he walked in a side entrance because somebody held the door open for him. And I jokingly said, like 10 years, 15 years ago, I worked at J.P. Morgan Chase, not to slam you guys, but I had to park on some far corner and walk all the way to France. So if you've been there, how do you think I got in a building every day? I tell you, right? So they get in your building. If the price is high enough, they're in. Don't kid yourself that they're not gonna find a way to get in. So once they get in, You've got mistakes all over the place because you're not perfect. You've got test systems. You've got, you got all sorts of shit, right? And then they, they literally come find an empty cube. They put a um, Raspberry Pi. They gateway out. They got gotcha. you. They live there now for the next two months. All right, so here's the thing, right? So we talk about culture in DevOps. And um, so imagine I just told you that, um, that like the way these, most of these people get in is they get in a building. But what the hacker didn't know is when I, you work for a company for 10, 15 years, right? Like, holding, not holding that door open for somebody, what happens? You get yelled at. Joe, you couldn't hold the door. What an asshole. And so at some point, you're like, you know what? I'm just not going to, you know, I'm going to hold the door. I just get tired of getting yelled at, right? Like, uh, it's called um, um, the normalization of deviance is the term of this. So imagine this. Imagine we say culture fixes everything. We should start with culture. Susie has 10 boxes. She's pregnant. It's raining. It's cold. She's three steps behind you. And you let the door close. Right? It's kind of a metaphor story. Or, or just a story, right? And, and so when you come in, you're like, oh, my God, I'm going to get so in trouble. And she's going to beat me up. And she walks up to you and says, I want to thank you for making our organization a safer place. To... It could be that simple. Anyway, I'm done. Thank you.